challenges are geospatial and so much of our big data is geospatial. How is the VIZ community addressing needs to visualize and analyze this data? Our review examines IEEE VIZ's recent contributions to geovisualization and geospatial analysis. We propose an interactive ensemble analysis framework that provides flexible interactive exploration of the ensemble data. Time series characteristics of data can be obtained by fast browsing time steps. The region stability heat map view shows the stability of the selected region and provides region adjustment by directly clicking. In this paper, we investigate design choices for work or flat maps by domain experts. We tackle two research questions, how do domain tasks influence the design choices, and what equal error projection is preferred. Through a survey, we collected 40 curvelet maps designed by 20 social scientists, and our analysis suggests that the choices vary across tasks, the projection was most important, and the equal error projection was preferred. In a visualization, laying out labels to data points needs to be done automatically with a fast labeling algorithm. We introduce occupancy bitmap. It's a data structure that helps the labeling algorithm to first, quickly record the positions of existing marks and labels, and second, quickly detect overlapping of labels to the recorded positions. Imagine you have tons of text data to analyze. And you want to get an overview of your data, but traditional topping modeling techniques such as LDA are not working for you. Then, why don't you try Architext? We introduced a scalable and flexible way to interactively build hierarchical topics. We demonstrate that people can use the spatial cues available in virtual reality to help them effectively remember and recall scholarly articles. We used a virtual coffee shop and asked participants to remember four abstracts from scientific publications. And we termed this method a virtual reality memory palace variety. The success of a commercial new network has been attracting many students and practitioners to learn the exciting technology. However, for beginners, the CN model is not easy to understand. We introduced the explainer, an interactive visualization tool to help beginners more easily learn about commercial neural network. Using the explainer, users can progressively explore the CN model with real-life images in their browser. Getting a comprehensive understanding of both high-level model structure and the low-level underlying mathematical operations. Magazine-style narrative visualizations can be challenging due to the need to go back and forth from the text to the visualization. We use eye tracking to monitor which sentence is currently being read and trigger visual links between that sentence and the corresponding data points in the visualization. Results show that the gaze-driven links increase comprehension of the documents without hindering reading time. In this presentation, we introduce a provenance library, TRAC, which makes implementing provenance in web-based tools easy. TRAC introduces a novel storage model for web-based provenance tracking and has an associated history visualization, which can be fully customized. 
Track also contains multiple ways to save and share individual states or entire sessions of an application and ensures that explored data is easy to analyze in interesting and unique ways. We propose X-Matrix, a novel method for random forest interpretability. From a random forest model, a logic rule is extracted from each decision path on every decision tree. Once the complete set of logic rules is obtained, visual representations can be built for global and local explanations. X-Matrix, making random forests interpretable. Program developers spend significant time on optimizing and tuning applications. But working with binary code to understand what compiler optimizations were applied can be challenging. We present our visual analytics system, CCNAP, designed to identify and assess compiler optimizations in binary code. Check out our paper to learn more. How many times have you asked yourself, why should I stay in academia? Junior researchers might ask this more often, but it's a popular topic among all levels of academic seniority. Our six panelists will discuss with you the controversial topic of pursuing an academic path in visualization, targeting an open discussion on the choice of staying or leaving, and keeping the specifics of our community in mind. Digital humanities present great opportunities for testing new visualization approaches and evaluation techniques. However, and given the diffuse character and novelty of the field, it may also be intimidating for novel and senior researchers willing to get started in the discipline. In this paper, we propose a data-driven analysis of visualization for the digital humanities to identify key themes, authors, and relevant publications. So if you want to know more, please read our paper. If machine learning were like education, we would like to test what concepts our student, the model, has learned. Has it learned the concept of object rotation? Does additional text help with object recognition? We need a methodology and platform for conducting such tests. In this paper, we present a novel visual analytics tool that enables hypothesis-based evaluation of machine learned models. Transport dynamics in non-steady flow can be visualized by the finite time lap on a fixed point. But what happens if the flow contains random Gaussian deviations? We introduce a recently published quantity that is similar to the FDLE but considers these stochastic deviations. We discuss the application to real-world data, compare it to prior methods and present a complementary visualization. As data is changing, our understanding of data should be updated correspondingly. Based on machine learning approaches, we formulate a drift level index to monitor the evolution of multi-source data, which allows users to capture and reason significant changes from time series data. The proposed visual analytics system is called Concept Explorer. More details can be found in our talk. We propose a new semi-automatic method that uses topological features to guide users in tracing neurons and integrate this method within a virtual reality framework. We use the Morse smell complex to find a set of candidate neuron arcs. The candidate arcs are integrated into a VR neuron tracing system and exposed through a Morse smell complex guided semi-automatic tracing tool. The topological ridge graph underlying our MSC guided tool is robust against gaps in the signal. All of the distribution samples refer to the test samples not well covered by the training data, like these black cats. They are misclassified with high confidence due to their black bodies. To explain why these samples are out of distribution, we developed OD Analyzer, a visual analytics tool which provides an ensemble detection method and a grid-based visualization to detect and analyze out of distribution samples. After determining the departure timestamp, the experts then moved to verify the recommended shuttle stops and routes. 
Note that Shuttlefish recommends the default shuttle stops and routes based on the metric of average distance. Then they observed that in R cluster 4, the system recommends Heijin Genyuan as the shuttle bus stop but the experts identified that another drop-off spot Pan Shanhuayuan is located in the middle part in this regional cluster. Transitions are widely used in the videos to build seamless changes between video narrative. As the attention queue, they can not only keep viewers oriented but also express narrative information. After conducting a content analysis on the transitions in the dataset, we provide a comprehensive taxonomy of narrative transitions in data videos. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter so you can make better decisions faster. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Share your analysis securely. Your entire organization can access these interactive dashboards from any browser or mobile device to find their own answers. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. Our research goal was to design an efficient preview method of the parallel vectors operator through direct volume ray casting. As such, we present the first implicit ray caster of parallel vectors feature curves that reaches real-time performance for interactive parameter exploration and preview by applying tensor product calling and a sectional Newton descent. VisaVis is a visual support system for the development of visualization algorithms. It has live compilation, automatic version control, predefined interactions, and tools for visual parameter analysis. By displaying the complete history of the algorithm, users get insights into the correlation between source code changes and visual differences. Programmers often make mistakes like this. A BS function is incorrectly called with a string. A programming language can catch such mistakes early on, but for this, it needs a type system. We present Typical, an interactive visualization tool for programming language designers. Typical allows them to explore common function type signatures and helps create a type system. The recent COVID epidemic has triggered several different crises that are testing our civilization's potential for both coordination and cooperation. Data about infection rates and their growth has been the main source for public discussion and has inspired many visualization works. We propose a VA approach that incorporates a growth predictive model. This allows the correlation monitoring of the virus population development. We also can relate it to different government response events, as well as identify key dates. Interacting with large datasets could be painfully slow. We can reduce the latency with faster backends, but that's not always attainable. Here, we investigate a solution that only leverages techniques on the front end. We propose interaction snapshots, where users can view the results at a later time. We found that users experienced much less frustration and were able to complete the tasks faster. Billions of biologging records reflect animal behaviors on many temporal spatial scales, yet segmenting the time series on multiple scales is often avoided or impeded. Hence we present our Multisec VA platform with its three contributions. First, Multisec VA contributes tailored visual interactive features for multi-scale segmentation. Second, we show a new visual query language to flexibly configure scale-wise techniques and parameters. This VQL consumes a domain-oriented set of techniques, our third contribution. <laughs> Thank you.
Oh, it's Heather. Hi, Heather. <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome back to the fifth workshop on visualization for the digital humanities or welcome to those of you just now tuning in. I'm Catherine DeRose and on behalf of the organizing committee, I have the very great pleasure of introducing our capstone speakers today, professors Catherine Diagnazio and Lauren Klein. But we'll only hear from Lauren today as Catherine had a last minute but not serious conflict emerge. As a reminder, you've composed questions as you think of them to the conference discord or YouTube channels. Or if you want, you can uh, post your question on Twitter, tagging viz for dh During the q and I'll relay those questions. But for now, I will introduce our speakers, one present and one in absentia. When the organizing committee was first thinking about who to invite as our speaker for today, we knew we wanted someone who would engage critically with data visualization from both the data and the visualization side. We were imagining someone who could speak to the possibilities that are opened up when we think more expansively about what counts as data and what frameworks we draw on or need to develop for working with that data responsibly. It should come as no surprise then that we immediately thought not of one person, but of two. Catherine Diagnazio, an assistant professor of urban science and planning at MIT, is a hacker mama, scholar, and artist designer who focuses on feminist technology, data literacy, and civic engagement. She is the director of the Data Plus Feminism Lab at MIT, and is one of the creators behind databasic.io, a user-friendly and sophisticated platform that introduces newcomers to data science by offering a suite of tools and guides for getting started. Lauren Klein is an associate professor in the departments of English and Quantitative Theory and Methods at Emory University, where she also directs their Digital Humanities Lab. Her work crosses the fields of digital humanities, data science, and early American literature and she is the co-editor of the much beloved and influential Debates in the Digital Humanities, a hybrid print digital publication series that explores debates in the field as they emerge. Together, their collaborative work is advancing the way that we think about, create, and represent data. Their recently co-authored Data Feminism, which was published to much acclaim earlier this year by MIT Press, charts a course for more ethical and empowering data science practices and expands upon ideas they raised in a position paper at the very first workshop on visualization for the digital humanities back in 2016. This is a paper that those of us who are at that first workshop still refer back to frequently in both our research and teaching. I'm so delighted then to welcome them back to viz for dh this time for their capstone talk titled after their book, Data Feminism. Lauren, the Zoom is yours. Thank you so much for that really kind and generous introduction. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I have to say it's it's really nice to uh, and sort of heartening to be able to speak to the same audience, which really was um, the audience that prompted Catherine and me to begin working together and to begin thinking about what feminism could do for visualization. Um, and I have to say just on an anecdotal note, so, um, Amidst the strangeness that is COVID, I was just yesterday driving um, from New Jersey, where my parents live, um, back to Atlanta, where I live and where I am now. Um, I'm currently on the Emory campus, but locked out of my office because I can't get in on the weekends. Um, but I was driving by that conference hotel um, in Baltimore and thinking, oh, the last time I was here <laughs> um, was for, for, uh, for Viz, whenever that was, 2016. Okay, I'm gonna try um, sharing my screen here. Okay, oh, let's move the chat out of the way. Um, does this look good to everyone? Can everyone see? Okay, great, super, um, excellent. So I'm gonna spend uh, about a half hour sort of talking a little bit about the rationale for uh, me and Catherine to write the book and a little bit of what the book has in it um, oriented towards this. Um, but I'm gonna try to talk a little bit less than I might ordinarily because I'm very interested to hear your uh, ideas and your questions. Um, and I should say just uh, at the outset, obviously, um, you know, as uh, we've already heard, this is a co-authored project and in an ideal non-COVID scenario, Catherine would be here too, um, but she had a, an unexpected uh, delay and she is not able to connect to the internet at the moment. So um, this is a picture of her. 
Um, she is terrific and you should look up all of her, uh, her other work in addition to data feminism. And if you have questions about uh, those projects, you should feel free to get in touch with her. Um, the picture of the book is what you see on the left. And also um, I should, put a, should have put a link in here, but it's now available open access. So if you Google data feminism, um, MIT Press open access or whatever, um, you should be able to find an open access version of the book. It's not as pretty as the, the print book, which we try to make a, a nice object, um, but all of the same contents are there. Um, so we really see data feminism as part of a growing body of work that is holding corporate and government actors accountable for their sexist, racist, classist data products. So you can think of things like face detection systems that can't see women of color. This came up recently with the whole remote proctoring of the bar exam. We saw this um, not just in police surveillance, but in sort of more mundane um, scenarios. Um, things like hiring algorithms that demote applicants that went to all women's schools. We saw this came up when come up when Amazon tried to implement like a first cut um, resume screening system, which was modeled on their existing employees, which were predominantly men, and therefore people who went to all women's schools were scored lower um, by the software. Um, you know, search algorithms that circulate negative stereotypes about black girls. Um, you see this in Sophia Noble's work on algorithms of oppression. Um, the recent fiasco with um, the, the A-level uh, predictive model uh, used, used to predict A-level test scores because the actual exams had to be canceled because of the pandemic, but it took the school's past performance into account and therefore students who attended sort of historically underperforming schools got their test scores artificially lowered and those who attended fancier schools in fancier neighborhoods got their test scores artificially raised. Um, you know, I could go on, um, and that, that's kind of the point, right? Um, you know, whereas corporations see data as the new oil, um, and they mean this in a good way, um, so that data seems to them as a sort of untapped natural resource that can lead to profit once it's processed and refined, you have women, and particularly women of color, as well as indigenous people, um, immigrant communities, LGBTQ folks and more, um, they, we um, experience this very same process of data extraction. Um, since if you're talking about oil, that's, that's really the metaphor um, as just the same old oppression. And Catherine and I are really not the first ones to, not by any means the first ones, um, to have made the case that this oppression is real, um, it is ongoing, and it is nece really necessary to dismantle. And what we try to do in the book um, in our own contribution is to explain how feminism and intersectional feminism in particular has been focused on dismantling instances of oppression and the forces of power that caused them for a very, very long time. So, um, you know, feminism, it, it means a lot of things to a lot of different people. And so I just wanted to spend a few minutes at the outset doing some level setting just about how we use the term in the book and what this means for visualization. Um, so what you see here is an image from the 2014 MTV Music Awards, this is Beyonce. Um, and she projected the word feminist behind her um, because she sings about feminism in her song Flawless. That was the name of her album that was released that year. Um, and she includes a sample of what turns out to be the American Heritage Dictionary definition of the term. So you hear, it's actually um, the, the Humanists and literary scholars in particular will be interested to know it's the it's Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, the Nigerian novelist um, who Beyonce samples saying feminist, the person who believes in equal rights for men and women. Um, and then we added non-binary people. Um, so basically the takeaway from this is that feminism is a belief in equality. So um, the Merriam-Webster also gives a second definition, which is helpful in sort of expanding the scope of what we mean by feminism. And this is organized activity on behalf of women and non-binary people's rights and interests. And so you can take away from this that in addition to feminism being a belief in equality, it also entails political action. And then a third definition that we get, um, which is the sort of set of theories and ideas. And this is really where feminism begins to sort of crack open for our use in visualization. So these theories began by thinking through issues of inequality with respect to sex and gender. But the past 40 years of scholarship and then sort of the reality of living in the world, um, our current political situation, this has meant that 
um, many, many more dimensions of inequality have come into the conversation. So this includes race, class, sexuality, ability, um, and more. And so this sort of this idea of bringing these additional dimensions of um, oppression sort of back into the equation brings me back around to the idea of intersectional feminism and how in our view and what we say in the book is that feminism in the year 2020 must be understood as intersectional. Um, and so at this point, you know, I think most people sort of have a passing understanding of what this term means, but just as a primer. Um, so intersectionality is a term coined by the legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw, um, which she uses to explain how social inequality cannot be explained by only one dimension of difference like gender. Um, so when we're talking about inequality or oppression, we must be talking about the intersection. She means this in a very visual way. Um, the intersection of the many factors and force that that, forces that produce it. So this includes sexism, but also racism, classism, colonialism, and so on. Um, so the one sort of thing to understand about intersectionality, and this is a thing that's actually often overlooked in casual invocations of the term, is that intersectionality doesn't just describe markers of individual identity and their effects. Um, so not just like, okay, here's me, I am white, I am a cis woman, I am a tenured professor, I live in the US South, you know, my, I have evidently spotty internet access. Um, you know, so it doesn't just describe these sort of markers of individual identity. What it describes are the structural forces of power and their intersection that make those markers of identity matter, that produce the effects that I experience as a result of my identity. Um, and it's the work of women of color feminists, and I mean this in a general sense, but in particular, black feminists um, that have foregrounded this conversation about forces of power, the shift from sort of the markers of identity of individual sort of who I, how I define myself to the larger forces of power that produce the effects that I feel. So uh, to sort of sum up this first little, uh, this little section, intersectional feminism, which really provides this underlying framework for our book, it's not only about issues uh, relating to women, um, it's not even only about gender, it's about power. Um, it's about who has it and who doesn't. And in today's world, you, you, data is power. Um, and you see this in the idea of data as the new oil. Um, you also see this in the idea of data as the same old oppression. And intersectional feminism, when applied to data science or to the visualization that is required um, of data science, um, really what our, what our gambit is, is that uh, intersectional feminism can help that power be challenged and changed. And our argument really distilled into a single line is that data science needs feminism and intersectional feminism in particular, if we ever hope to overturn these power imbalances. So uh, in writing the book, and I should back up and say sort of even in, write, in writing that first viz paper, um, what Catherine and I did was we sat down, or rather, I guess we were collaborating remotely even then. So we were talking via, I guess we were using Skype at the time. Um, but we got ourselves together and we asked ourselves sort of, what have we learned from all of our schooling in feminist scholarship, in our participation in various activism communities, um, you know, like what are the things that we've absorbed from all of the different sources um, that we've uh, sort of been exposed to over the years? And how can we distill these into principles for working with data and in the beginning actually for working with visualization? Um, and we came up with these seven principles that to us encapsulate the most important aspects of intersectional feminism as they relate to data. Um, examine power, challenge power, rethink binaries and hierarchies, elevate emotion and embodiment, embrace pluralism, consider context, and make labor visible. Um, and there's, these are actually a little bit different than the principles that are in the Viz paper, and we can talk a little bit uh, about the reasons for that in the Q&A. That's actually, it's like a fun and interesting thing to talk about. Um, but in any case, our goal sort of then as now was to really operationalize feminism for data science. Um, and it's interesting because I think that to this people operationalizing theory is like a totally normal thing to humanists when they hear the word operationalize anything, they panic. Um, but our goal was um, essentially to provide models, um, sort of concrete models that might guide the work of people working with data, 
um, or who want to work with data or people who want to refuse to work with data um, for political or sort of broader ideological grounds. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is just talk about really just a handful of examples that exemplify the kind of work that we talk about in the book. And hopefully you can get a sense of how, sort of what we mean by operationalizing feminism for working with data. And I've tried to pick some, some busy ones. Um, uh, so hopefully they'll be interesting to you. Um, so actually this one is, it's a visual project. It's not a visualization project. Um, so we talk about early in the book um, when talking about the principle of examining power, projects like Mimi Onuoha's library of missing data sets. Um, so missing data sets are Onuoha's way of describing data sets that a reasonable person might expect to exist um, because they address issues of pressing social need, but because of various reasons, um, usually political ones, um, they don't actually exist in real life. Um, so data sets on uh, Mimi's list, like trans people killed or injured in instances of hate crime, right? This is an instance where this is an issue that is um, uh, it, global, um, it is severe, it is impactful, it matters to these communities, and yet governments either at the federal, state, local level have not decided that this is an important issue enough to collect data on, and therefore the sort of systematic nature of trans hate crimes and uh, tra violence against trans people has not been uh, brought to the surface. Um, you know, even right now, I mean, I feel like we have an example sitting in plain sight, which is COVID data. You know, look at all of the ways in which the federal government has tried to not count data, miscount data, remove data, so that we do not have accurate data about the true extent of the coronavirus pandemic in the United States. Um, so anyway, so, so Onuoha, uh, she exhibits the library of missing data sets two ways. Uh, the first is a GitHub repository. You can actually Google that now, um, uh, just library of missing data sets GitHub. Um, and actually that's, that's what you see in the screenshot on the right. It also includes actually a really nice um, artist statement um, that describes some of her motivation in more detail. Um, but she also exhibits this as a physical artwork. Um, that's the, the file cabinet that you see on the left. Um, and the files are labeled with the titles of each of the missing data sets. Um, the idea is you sort of tab through them and you find one that looks interesting to you or you want to learn more. But when you go to open the folder, um, it's empty, right? Because the data set is missing. And the point is that they are empty because of a lack of personal, social, political, or governmental will or sort of some com uh, combination of these. And so when we're talking about um, forces of power, you know, what are the larger forces of power that produce the effects that we experience? Um, this is the kind of thing that we're talking about. And the first step involved in data feminism, and the, really, uh, the re reason why this is the first principle in the book, um, is that you really need to understand how forces of power operate um, and how they determine what data are collected and what are not, or even more broadly, what research is undertaken and what is not. And then once you start to understand how these forces of power are sort of over-determining or predetermining the questions we can ask, then we can start to take steps to rebalance those forces of power and begin to ideally affect change. Um, and just sort of one more quick note about this, um, sort of lest you think that missing data can't ever be visualized. Um, so this is a, just a, it's, it's an artwork that many of you actually may be familiar with. Um, this is actually a still from a moving uh, visualization by Georgia Lupi and Kathy King. It's called Bruises, the Data We Don't See. Um, this is another kind of missing data. Um, this is data that documents qualitative experience and subjective perception. In this case, as they relate to a mother, that's Kaki King, um, taking care of her child as she dealt with a serious illness. And Lupi and King had to think really hard how to figure out sort of how to constitute these data so that they could then give them visual form. But after that long and intentional process, the end result is an image that testifies to all of the emotion and labor and work um, that might not otherwise be recorded as data. Um, and this actually relates to another principle from the book about making labor visible, um, which is actually just a feminist move because of just how much work women and non-binary people do that is invisible and uncompensated and so on. Um, we can talk more about this later. Um, but I just wanted to make clear the point that just because data is missing, it doesn't mean that it can't be visualized. Um, so in the book, we also talk about counter data collection efforts like this one um, undertaken by San Francisco's anti-eviction mapping project, which you see here. Um, 
and actually it's a it's it is a counter data collection effort but it's actually also i'm going to talk about it in the context of the idea of embracing pluralism um because since its inception the aemp has actually worked in collaboration with tenants rights organizations and community groups in the bay area in order to collect and map data about the eviction crisis that you know again sort of for a while was local to that geographic reason but you know as covid has uh, come come to you know pretty much everywhere in the world but in the us in particular eviction is a crisis that is is happening everywhere and impacting a huge proportion of um, people and families in this country right now. Um, so anyway, you can tell this is sort of like a DIY map and I'm gonna get to that uh, in a minute, um, but just so you know what's going on, um, each red dot indicates a place where a person or a family was evicted and the blue dots indicate places where the AEMP has also interviewed one of the people who was evicted from that place. And if you click on one of the blue dots, you get a link to one of these video interviews like the one you see on the right. Um, of Phyllis Bowie. She's a Midtown resident who's facing eviction. Um, and so in the book, we contrast that AEMP map that you were just looking at with the work of the eviction lab, which is based at Princeton. Um, and the eviction lab's goal is similar, um, but it's actually to present a national picture of the eviction crisis. Um, and this is, I should say, sort of before I get into the critique of this, um, it's a, you know, an absolutely worthy goal. The project itself is incredibly valuable. Um, and actually, I, I, they have really, they've really, they've they write some great papers, which I teach in my classes, and we can talk about that later. Um, but the point here is that it's wildly different in terms of process. Um, so the eviction maps, labs, uh, uh, eviction labs maps, um, they derive from seemingly bigger data, um, right? So we're looking, you know, they say it's a national, we're looking at eviction nationally, um, where the map that we're looking at, like this is of the whole country, right? It seems to give a more comprehensive picture of the problem of eviction in the United States. Um, and actually you could say sort of by sort of best practices, it's sort of a better visualization, right? And we'll talk about that some more in a minute. Um, but what the AEMP has shown is that national real estate databases like the ones that the eviction lab uses significantly undercount evictions. Um, and you can think about a lot of the reasons why this might be true on the, like to begin, you know, the real estate industry does not have, there's no, they, they gain nothing by counting any more evictions than they need to, right? They are in the business of making money on the sale of homes. Um, if the way in which they create more uh, market availability, more homes to sell becomes suspect in the lease, they will get more scrutiny. So they do not want to count any more evictions than they have to. Um, and then the other thing, and this is something that I think, um, you know, students can relate to, or anyone who's been a student can relate to a lot, like, there are a lot of ways to be evicted that don't involve being served with a formal eviction paper, right? Um, your landlord can not fix your broken appliances, like your stove can break, your toilet can break, your landlord can just not fix it, so your home eventually over time becomes first annoying and then uninhabitable. Um, the landlord can, like, use the key to get in your apartment and, you know, make you feel unsafe, they can lurk in the lobby, they can raise the rent a lot, you know, all of these things are not counted as evictions by the law, but have the effect of evicting people. Um, and so what the AEMP has done is because they work with local communities and with tenants rights organizations in particular, they actually have more complete data because they have the data from the tenants who come to the community organizations and say, help me, my landlord is threatening me, or help me, my rent is being raised, I need to move. Um, and so what the AMP has shown is they actually um, have much more accurate, uh, much bigger and more contextualized data that documents a greater extent of the problem at hand. Um, and this is what is gained when you embrace pluralism. You know, admittedly, you get things that are probably messier, um, but they are more contextualized and more connected to the communities that sort of offer their data up to be counted. Um, and sort of just on a visualization note, I should say, you know, you also might be looking at this eviction lab map and saying, you know, this looks nice, they did a good job here. Um, that other map was really messy um, on the subject of mess. Um, but in a way, sort of rhetorically, that's kind of the point. You know, like, it's like all of the dots are occluding each other, right? And you're in general, you're supposed to avoid occlusion. Um, you know, that's it, like what you learn in any sort of intro viz course. But the point of the map is that there are too many evictions, right? There are too many to map. Um, there are too many to see because there are too many happening in the world. And so if you want to think about it sort of rhetorically, what that image, here, I'll just go back to it in a sec. 
um, is doing this. Oh, actually, never mind. I had a slide to show you the comparison. Um, so anyway, um, just the point being, sort of like occlusion is usually presented as a bad thing, um, but in this case, it sort of helps to reinforce the argument of the project, which is there are um, too many evictions to map, um, just as there are too many that should be experienced um, by individuals. So just sort of one last point about embracing pluralism, because this is something that, um, you know, I think comes up a lot. Um, when we're embracing, embracing pluralism in the process of creating a visualization or doing data science more generally, um, the reality is that we can't bring everyone's voices to the table, right? Like we don't have enough time, we are on deadlines, there's not enough funding. Um, so you need to make choices. And the question then becomes, whose voices do you prioritize? And feminists actually have a very clear answer here. Like it's not a hard question. Um, following the work of folks like um, Sandra Harding and Patricia Hill Collins, these are sort of early um, and sort of big feminist theorists, or you could even think of um, uh, Shawin Barzell and feminist HCI, um, a feminist design perspective would take power into account and deliberately center the experiences of people at the margins, first and foremost. So essentially making decisions from the outside in. Um, as the Design Justice Network says, we include a quote here because their project is super amazing. You can check that out too. Um, they say, quote, we center the voices of those who are directly impacted by the outcomes of the design process. Um, and so these are really the folks who we should be working hard to build relationships with. Um, and this is also why we need to start any design process by thinking about power so that we know how to identify these people and work with them to understand their needs so that we can in turn shape our projects um, to uh, reflect their desires. Okay. I have uh, one more example, and actually, I think this is an example that I probably talked about in 2016, but I've been vindicated and keeping on bringing it up because they, uh, this is a, a visualization by the design firm Periscopic. Um, and they actually just this year, just in the past months, updated this visualization with more recent data. Um, but I bring this up today to talk about um, sort, of, sort of shift the focus a little bit. Um, so all of the examples that I've been talking about so far have focused on the issue of power and people, um, sort of people who have power and people who have don't, right? Um, but another major idea that comes from feminism relates to structures of power, so conceptual structures of power, and more specifically, binary structures. So structures that are defined by like a hard distinction between two groups. So um, feminist theory has helped to show how these binary distinctions are actually usually hiding a hierarchy. Um, usually when you're presented with a choice, um, it's first of all sort of a false choice. And second of all, the reason why you've been made to feel like you need to choose is one choice is sort of implied to be better than the other. Um, and once you sort of see how there's this hierarchy um, sort of hidden in it, you start to understand why there is this sort of artificial insistence on a rigid distinction or a hard line between two groups anyway. Um, what it's there, what it's doing is to ensure that one group stays on the top and the other on the bottom. So just to sort of bring this down to a specific example, so the idea of man and the idea of women, like this is an obvious reference point, right? So, um, you know, it's a clear example, both of a false binary, right? There are more than two genders. Um, and it's also an unequal hierarchy. So among these genders, no gender is better than any of the others. Um, but you can see how historically, um, you know, the reason why we sort of this Anglo Western we um, have developed this belief in this binary, the binary gender um, is because men have a vested interest in keeping themselves on top and keeping everyone else um, out below. Um, that's why there's that hard line to ensure that there's no, there's not free movement between the two. Um, but one of the key moves of feminist theory, and I'm talking sort of more about theoretical feminism at this point, is to take this critique of the gender binary um, and to use the same model to question other binaries and hierarchies that we encounter in the world. So you can think about the distinction between nature and culture, right? They're sort of like, you know, again, we tend to believe that culture is more developed, more evolved than something that is natural. You know, um, you can think of characterizations of, um, let's see, what's an example here? The way in which sort of like uh, early Americans characterized uh, Native Americans as sort of less culturally advanced, right? Like that's a, first of all, a false binary, and second of all, a sort of clear hierarchy, right? They were concerned about um, sort of transfer between groups. But you can also think, you know, just in terms of um, conducting research, the division between subject and object, like why is there this 
hard line that is placed between us, the researchers, and our objects of inquiry. Um, or another example that, uh, or another sort of example um, that this example takes up is this distinction between reason and emotion, right? Um, and so the feminist move is also, is first to say like, okay, first of all, I'm gonna collapse this binary. And second of all, I'm gonna write it so that we can see that, you know, whatever, whatever we're dealing with, it's along a spectrum rather than, uh, you know, two separate independent groups. Um, and again, you know, we can see this play out, this distinction between reason and emotion um, and data visualization, like pretty acutely, right? Um, so best practices for viz, they involve what, like a clean design, um, a minimalist aesthetic, you know, presenting just the facts. But uh, sort of the question remains, like, why are these our best practices, especially when research has shown that we interpret these aesthetic choices just as emotionally. Um, you know, like people like Jessica Holman, right, has shown that we tend to believe that these minimal charts are more truthful than they are when she talks about the rhetoric of viz. Like if you have like source colon URL, people trust a visualization with a source line more than they do one without, regardless of whether or not they even check to see if that's a valid source. Um, you have people like um, Helen Kennedy, who shows people like crazy maximalist visualizations and you know, a plain one and then two weeks later comes back and says, what do you remember? And lo and behold, um, people under, they remember the contents of the maximalist visualization much, much more than sort of a neutral minimal design. Um, so what about that? What about visualizations that deliberately leverage emotion that recognize that it's there anyway and instead of trying to banish it, say, what can we do with this? Um, and that's what this example helps us see. Um, so uh, the large black images that you see at the top, they're actually, I think many of you probably know this, but I actually think that it's worth sort of hearing me talk through it again. And if you feel like watching this visualization, if you haven't in a while, you can just Google um, periscopic gun deaths and you can watch it as I, um, as I talk. Um, so what you're looking at is the number of gun related deaths in the United States in a particular calendar year. Um, and each of the people killed by a gun in that year is represented by a single arc. Um, so the arcs are traced one by one on the screen. They start out slow so you can read the information about a particular individual. Um, then they get faster and faster until they create this like semicircular web that you see. Um, and you know, I find this and I you know, have now watched this probably hundreds of times, but the visualization I find still sort of overwhelming to watch, um, you know, almost unbearable. And that's again, you know, similar to the AEMP map, that's precisely the point. You know, there are too many people being killed by guns in the United States, right? It's an epidemic. So, um, you know, just methodologically speaking, it's no less statistically sound than any other study. And actually I teach this method section to my, my staff students all the time. Um, so the data about people derived from a national crime data set, there's actually crime.gov gives you all sorts of data on crimes, who knew, now you know. Um, the projected lifespans of each individual are based off of a World Health Organization model that itself is like pretty heavily theorized and is very contextual and you can read about that too. Um, but it was really viewed with suspicion, um, especially from like infobiz, not as much design, but like infobiz um, because it made us feel things. And a feminist approach here would say, um, you know, that's not a problem at all that it made us feel things. And in fact, it's a more compelling visualization precisely because it rejects the binary. It, actively blends reason with emotion. And once you sort of allow yourself to understand that this is okay, you can sort of rebalance this binary here. Um, what happens is that essentially your, your communication toolbox gets opened up to a whole uh, greater number of opportunities and options for design um, that really allow us to focus on what really matters in a design process, right? So honoring the context of the data, um, really architecting users' attention, and trying to take action to dismantle the binaries and hierarchies that we encounter in our attempts to do this type of interventionist work. Um, okay, um, so like, what does this mean for visualization designers? Does it mean that um, sort of, we should always want people to cry when they look at an image or sort of like always include video essays when we're plotting data points? Um, and the answer to these questions is actually no. Um, if there's any single rule in design, it's that context is queen, right? Um, a designed choice made in one context or for one audience does not translate to other contexts or audiences. Um, or just to sort of put it more simply, like it's never a good idea to say never in design. And so here you see a quote from Fernanda Vegas, um, 
you likely know. Um, and she actually wrote this to us upon reading a draft of our book. Um, and we had a bit that criticized the sort of top down view from above, like large scale visualizations that don't speak to context or to individual experience. And she said like, hey, wait a minute. Um, now I'm quoting the kind of overview that data visualization provides is one of the superpowers that I treasure the most. Um, and the idea of it being a superpower, we like this quote so much that we wrote and we're like, hey, can we include this in the book? And she said, yes, and so you can find it quoted in the book. Um, but what I wanna emphasize here is, you know, it's not a profound point, or maybe it is a profound point, even if it's an obvious or commonplace one. Um, the idea of it being a superpower is really key um, because visualization designers do hold power, right? Um, which you can use like for good, you know, or for evil. Um, so I just wanna close with um, one last example of using what seems to be a conventional map and place name layout, but is actually incredibly intentional in terms of how the power that it sort of comes with this particular map is deployed. Um, so this is a map created by Margaret Pierce. Um, she's a cartographer and member of the citizen Powhatomi Nation. And she actually spent 15 months collecting indigenous place names from First Nations, um, from Metis and Inuit peoples. And she places them on a map of the landform of what we would recognize as Canada. Um, so Pierce designed this map to be the exact same size and scale and projection as the official map of Canada. Um, and she did this in order to sort of advocate for a reseeing of the same land under different terms. But there's actually sort of more of a twist, um, which is that even though the map appears to be comprehensive and complete and sort of think back to that map of the United States that I was talking about later, um, it doesn't actually reveal everything. Um, because of the large scale of the map, the dots don't actually grant a high degree of precision. Um, and actually, as you can see, if you sort of zoom in on the map, um, many of the places aren't actually even anchored to a specific place on the map, just the text is placed over that region. Um, What's more, to make the map, Pierce followed indigenous methods of respect, of responsibility, and of reciprocity. And so these meant understanding and respecting how and when indigenous peoples wanted to share their cultural property with her project. Um, and so this is actually where traditional visualization strategies actually offer what we could call protective effects, right? Um, they can communicate indigenous authority while protecting and preserving indigenous autonomy. So just to sort of sum up, um, uh, sort of this is like the final point that I wanna make before we move into the Q&A section. And it may already be obvious from these examples. Um, it's that data feminism insists on an expanded definition of data visualization and data science. Um, so our idea of data science or data visualization is not defined by the size of the data set or the technical credentials of the people undertaking the work. Um, you know, these concerns, they're really continually exclude, uh, used to exclude women and people of color from technical fields, right? Um, and they're also used, honestly, to exclude work that makes a contribution that is socio-technical rather than purely technical. And I think we've seen this conversation come up in this workshop over the years and um, at Viz more generally in the past couple of years. Um, but if we expand our definition of what data work means, then we can see clearly that some of the most exciting work in data science and data visualization today is being undertaken by artists, um, by journalists, by humanists, by community organizers, by activists. Um, and sure, you know, some of this work does look like traditional data science or viz. Um, so you can see in the corner, there's a really nice paper by Margaret Mitchell and her team at Google. They work on uh, bias and natural language processing techniques. They've got some nice ggplot stuff in that paper, you know, whatever you can imagine it, you know what it looks like. Um, but that counts, right? That is data science. Um, but then next to Margaret's work, you can see in the middle, this is actually um, an artwork. It's an interactive AI by uh, Stephanie Dinkins. And it was trained on an intergenerational dialogue between black women and her family. Um, this is also data science. And then on the right, you see um, one of the uh, sort of interactive uh, scrolly telling viz things by the pudding, um, right? They do these like fun data journalism projects that this one in particular has to do with gender bias and Hollywood screenplays. This also counts, right? Um, and then finally the bottom, the mural that you see um, spread across the screen, this is by the group Data Therapy. And what they do is work with community-based organizations 
um, to first analyze and then visualize data relating to their community um, in the form of a mural, right, which does not look like a standard viz, but is very much a visualization of data. Um, this also counts. So, you know, the book is intentionally expansive. We have hundreds of examples of projects like this in the book. Um, and, you know, we really tried to select them carefully, um, both to sort of illustrate our points and then also to inspire um, our readers and you um, to action. Because, you know, the really key point is this, um, you know, data is at the root of so many problems today. Um, it, can, it can also be part of the solution. And that's something that Catherine and I both try to sort of inhabit in our work. Um, so just to, to close, I wanted to sort of end with some concrete things um, that data visualization designers, and I should say also sort of viz researchers can do, um, and actually, especially viz researchers, I actually feel like this is a huge, like an open field um, where so this work could have huge impact. Um, so um, do work that interrogates and exposes racism, sexism, and other forces of oppression, um, examine how these forces show up in data and viz and the world, uh, visualize counter data and missing data, use design to hold powerful institutions to account, use visualization to advocate for equity at your institution. This is another one that I think a lot of us could do pretty easily. Um, teach newcomers about data visualization and use Catherine's data basic suite, it's, it's terrific. Um, experiment with creative forms of data visualization. Um, like I've made, I've made a quilt, um, you just saw a sculpture and a mural. Um, we, I, there's an amazing data visualization fashion show that I don't have time to show you, but it's very cool, um, things like this. Um, include more people in the design process, especially impacted communities. Um, I think it's not just sort of as consultants in the project, but really in helping to formulate your research questions sort of in the beginning as well as the end. And then make sure you credit your sources and your design team, um, make your process transparent, reflect on your own identity. Um, and oh, I'm at the end of my list. Um, so uh, that's all I've got. Um, I'm really eager to hear your questions and your responses. Um, this is how you can contact both me and Catherine and learn more about the book. And um, yeah, so I will um, stop sharing my screen and uh, we, can, we can hear from the group. Thank you so much, Lauren, for that extremely important and persuasive talk. Um, as people start to add their comments to Discord or YouTube, I can start things off by uh, taking you up on your offer to explain a bit more about some of the differences the seven principles of data feminism underwent from the original 2016 paper to the book. Sure, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so essentially what happened is we just iterated. <laughs> um, but what was revealed, um, I think, were some important things. So the first, um, the first paper, you know, it was a workshop paper, you know, we did, we sat down, we did it, we came up with those principles. Um, and then when we drafted the book, we used those principles to structure the draft of the book. Um, and so we had them in that order. And we put the draft online. Uh, some of you might know this, but others of you might not. Um, we put the draft of the book online for an open peer review um, through the MIT Press. They have this uh, new digital scholarly publishing platform called PubPub. Um, you know, it went through regular peer review too, but we, we did this online. And one of the things that really became clear, we had had this chapter at the end called the power chapter. And all of our reviewers were like, why is this at the end? This is where you need to start. You know, we thought that we were sort of rhetorically packing a punch. You know, you go through all these little examples and then the, the sum total is that you realize that everything has to do with power. Um, but we realized in the peer review that, that you can't, none of this work, you wouldn't know how to structure any inquiry if you did not begin by doing a power analysis of the research landscape. Um, and so first we moved the power chapter to the beginning of the book. And then we realized we actually had too much to say for a single chapter. Um, and so we, um, and so we split it up into two. And so that's why there, are, we went from six principles to seven. Um, and we went from, um, uh, power at the end to power at the beginning. Um, and I would say along the way, you know, one chapter, which we thought about including, but we didn't was a chapter on uncertainty. Um, and I think that actually is really resonant in visualization communities, but we actually ended up folding that into the chapter on emotion and embodiment, because a lot of the feminist theorizations of uncertainty come through, again, you know, what I was talking about during the talk, this sort of suspicion of binaries, um, of the 
and which binaries are in effect a manifestation of a desire for certainty, right? Like you want to know what category something belongs in. And feminist critiques of binaries, um, which are also critiques of hierarchies, have, you know, they're all rooted in this embrace of the uncomfortable middle, right? The uncertain to say, you actually gain a richer sense of what you, who you are, what you want to know about, um, this particular area of inquiry, if you sort of refuse or you refuse the desire or the insistence in some cases that things be separated neatly into groups or that you quantify everything or that you visualize everything. If you are okay um, with certain things sort of exceeding the bounds of rational comprehension um, of uh, concrete classification of a particular margin of error or whatever, um, then that actually gives your project um, more context, not less. Um, and we ended up, we realized that sort of the, while we could have had a chapter, I think that would have said, you know, embrace uncertainty or something like that, it would have used the exact same theorists as the chapter that has to do with emotion and embodiment because it's all coming from the same uh, sort of conceptual point. Um, and so, uh, so that's why that is not there. Um, and then the other thing that I will say is that if we were doing it again, <laughs> Catherine and I actually think that we probably would have switched the order of one of the chapters. We actually have the chapter on categories um, after the chapter on emotion and embodiment. And I think, again, this is sort of a vestige of the project beginning as a viz project. Um, you know, the paper really was, you know, because Catherine and I came together, I've been working on this idea of feminist data visualization from a historical perspective, looking at some of earlier or sort of early women data visualization designers and why they were sort of excluded from the standard narrative that we tell about like Playfair and Menard and whatever. Um, and talking about actually they weren't just women, but they actually sort of inhabited feminist theoretical principles. And Catherine had sort of taken this from a contemporary perspective and looking at like, well, what would um, this idea of feminist data visualization look like right now? Um, so we really wanted to sort of crack open visualization, but we realized that we couldn't get to the point of presenting or communicating the data without having looked at the entire process of data analysis, right? You know, you really need to intervene. There's a slide that we sometimes include in uh, talks, but I didn't put it in this one. Um, it's like, well, how, where do you make a project feminist? And the answer is like everywhere, all the time at every phase of the process, right? You wanna be talking to impacted communities if you're studying them, talk to them when you're designing the project, include them as co-authors, not just consultants or as sort of asking for user feedback, things like this. Um, use it when you're assigning tasks to the group, use it when you're figuring out, you know, how you are going to construct the data set, how you are going to construct the questions, um, what, pro what pathways do you pursue, which ones do you sort of uh, let fall away, you know, all the time, right? And so we thought that, you know, if we were going to uh, sort of put our money where our mouth was or where our, our hands and eyes were, um, you know, it would be too late to only start thinking about how feminism could contribute to um, images and interactions if we hadn't already been thinking about how issues of power really overdetermine, you know, well, the world, but in, like academic research um, and design projects in particular. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, it's also a really great plug for collaborative work in open peer review. Yeah, totally. Um, I mean, I can go on the open peer review. Like we were terrified because, um, you know, I am like a meticulous wordsmither who only releases what I think yeah. is like a perfect, perfect, perfect thing. Um, but we didn't have time. We knew, we knew that we needed additional feedback. And um, we knew that Catherine and I, like we, the two of us did not know enough. And this is another mm -hmm. feminist principle, right? Like no single person knows everything. And because we were deliberately trying to include a real range of perspectives, you know, Catherine and I just didn't have access to that knowledge and we needed to get it from other people. And people were unfailingly kind and generous and no one was mean. We did not get doxxed. Like, you know, it was, you know, Yes, so glad to hear that. Um, some questions have started coming in. I'm going to connect two of them that might be linked or you can take them separately. Um, the first part is what are your thoughts on accountability in data visualization? And that might be connected to another question that's come in about um, your point to that context is key. And so it was asking about how do you teach context to your students and how do you safeguard or anticipate the way that your visualization or data might be exported to other contexts? Those are both really good questions. I mean, I think the move towards accountability, I, I sort of, I both really like it and I am a little bit fearful 
Um, and I'll say this because the idea of sort of holding yourself accountable and sort of asking like, to whom are you accountable? This really does come out of um, activism. Um, you know, this is a mantra that, you know, you go to any sort of like organizing session and people will say like, remember who you are accountable to. And that is so important. And actually, you know, you see this in the current election, right? With sort of the left saying like elect Biden then hold him accountable. This is the language of, you know, this is their language of radical critique. Um, and so on the one hand, I am happy to see this entering um, visualization and conversations about AI and machine learning and things like this. Um, because I do think it's a better term than responsibility or whatever, because it really does imply that you, there is a, um, there is a relationship. It is not necessarily a reciprocal one, um, but you have sort of obligations, right? Um, that you must uphold. Um, but I'm fearful that taken out of this context, it will sort of become this sort of uh, watered down term that where people sort of forget what it really means, which is, you know, it is a serious contract. And there is, there is a lot of responsibility when you take on the um, responsibility of trying to uplift, to give um, visibility to, to make sense of someone else's data. Like there's a lot that comes with that. Um, and so that's sort of how I would caveat that. Um, the second question about context and how you introduce it. Um, you know, I would say it is both, it takes time. It takes more time than we usually leave for context in methods courses. I will say that like usually methods courses, you're working with toy data. The point is sort of conveying some sort of lesson about some sort of universalized approach that students can then apply on their own. Um, but I think that, and you know, I teach, I, I moved, actually it's funny, I used to teach more biz classes and now I've moved to a more statsy kind of data science department. And so I teach more um, text analysis classes now. But the same thing is true. Um, you do need to make more time in the classroom and in the syllabus to introduce the context around the data. And there is a way in which you can sort of get bogged down in that context in a way that sort of loses its value for students who are there to sort of expand their toolbox. Um, but it doesn't take as much time as you think to take a meaningful data set that either has contemporary relevance or that you can convey the sort of, you know, gloss the relevance pretty quickly that it's not just like, you know, car make and models or like Usenet, like a mat, like, I don't know, you know, like so much of text analysis right now uses Usenet data. And like, I was a nerd on the internet in the nineties. I know what that is, but you spend more time explaining to your students what Usenet is before they like classify those things. than um, if you just picked an example, like, you know, song lyrics or whatever, um, that they would, um, they would understand more easily in terms of um, sort of things being taken out of context. I mean, you know, I think on the one, like some of that you can't control, right? Um, you know, we've all seen how, um, <laughs> I like your cat showing up. <laughs> Speaking of this out is, of context. Yes. Out of context, this is uh, Zoom in 2020. I'm, I'm definitely pro more cats on the screen. Um, you know, I think that, you know, that's always a risk. And I think that um, uh, thinking about the sort of unintended consequences or the potential for harm if your data or your visualization is taken out of context in a bad way, actually is something that we should all be thinking about more. And I know that like the ACM has provided some, or at least on their sort of their, their website, they've sort of proposed that we might consider sort of what they call like unintended consequences, which I think is again, sort of a more neutral phrasing of what we're really talking about. It's like, when can our work do harm? Or when can our work be used to advance an argument that is counter to the desire of the work that we were trying to do. Um, and, you know, and I think that we need to, you know, again, sort of, even though we wouldn't like to, we do need to sort of imagine for the worst because we live in a world in which the worst is playing out right now. I mean, some people say like the worst is yet to come, but like, it's pretty bad right now. And so I think even when we could assume the best in everyone, especially like people on the internet, um, you cannot do that anymore. And so I don't think it's bad to think, you know, in whose, whose interests are being served by publishing, um, spreading widely this particular image or interaction or data set or whatever, opening it up. And then whose interest, who may be harmed for that exact same interaction? And if the answer is like people may be harmed, then sometimes you do not spread it widely. And sometimes you publish it, you limit what you show 
Um, this can mean anything from, and Catherine has actually done some really good work on when you either exclude outliers or you um, deliberately re-aggregate data in order to protect um, small populations or, or vulnerable populations. Um, you know, this also means like if you have a chart that shows something that needs to be contextualized and you do not want it to be taken out of the larger framing, thinking about how you publish that and spread it. I mean, I think these are real questions and I think that they are, even, they matter even more now and they're worth, you know, even if they're no good answers, I think that it is worth talking about them and thinking about them. And I think my answer to this would have changed, like has definitely changed from, you know, five years ago where I would have been like, well, you know, it's on them, um, you know, data literacy, everyone should be data like, but I actually think this is a real risk um, in many more ways than we, uh, again, sort of as relatively privileged and protected academics um, would tend to think. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, another question that has come in says, thank you so much for this talk and for talking about emotional and embodied visualization. What would you say to graduate students or young scholars who want to do this work, but who are constrained by their fields and or institutions expectations that might devalue the work? Example, not counting creative work as scholarship or penalizing feminist visualizations as biased. Yeah, I mean, so I think that it's, there's a couple of different answers to this. First of all, do the work. Um, I think strategically, um, there are ways, especially if you're a student, where you can publish the work, the same work, reframed for different audiences and work that to your advantage, right? Like you can have an artwork, like this is something that I've done, and then like, you know, like pitch it to Kai Interactivity or do a user study and then incorporate that into some sort of more formal viz research, right? You can do that, you can have that same work um, work for you in different ways and for different audiences, and that is fine. Um, and in many, like, and I actually think that's better because if you're doing good work, you want it to reach different audiences that communicate and assess that work in different ways. Um, so that's sort of um, practically what I would say. Um, in terms of the pushback that like this work is, you know, biased or like not objective or whatever, in many ways, I feel like that's on people like with tenure and the advisors to make the case that that is not true, right? Um, first of all, by saying like, you know, any particular theoretical school of thought, but feminism in particular, should be, this should be like the easiest sell. Like feminist theory is like as old as theories come, right? You know, this is an incredibly, you know, rich and deep body of like sort of area of thinking that has a long and storied history in other academic communities. And it's on the advisor or the, you know, tenured co-author or whatever, like to, to help show students how they can make that case in the language that the particular audience will have. Um, similarly, you know, this idea that emotional visualization is like biased or less objective or something, it's on us. And I mean, like, you know, like tenure people who advise students to say, look, you know, all, okay, this question of like, is that bias, is it not? Is it objective or it's not? Like, that's the wrong question. The question is like, what are the design decisions that were made when you began the project? Were they intentional? Were they backed up by some sort of theoretical or apparatus? Um, and, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, how can you, um, you know, again, sort of, these are the things that we need to do in order to make the case that this is a valid form of research in the way that any other form of research is just as, uh, arbited by decisions and prior research and, um, you know, scaffolded upon the work of others. Um, I, you know, one of the things that I, I feel like I need to push back against is that this kind of work sort of like somehow it like destabilizes um, and is sort of less helpful and less uh, generative in their sort of like larger goal of advancing knowledge. And the reality is that doing this kind of work gives us more knowledge. It makes our work more accurate. It makes it richer. And we understand more about what we are learning from our data and then what we are not so that we can again better and more uh, and better apply our work and apply it with more validity to the appropriate populations or contexts, right? Um, again, you know, it's rejecting this binary that if you do one, you need to not be doing the other. Um, I'm just saying more is always, it's always a both ends. That's actually a perfect note maybe to wrap up this session. Um, I'm keeping sort of an eye on the time, but there are lots more questions still coming into the discords. Maybe Lauren, if you, if you have a moment at some point, you can jump on discord and chat with people there. But on behalf of the organizers and everyone who attended virtually today, I really do want to thank you again for this talk. It was really phenomenal. Um, I can't wait to see how the project continues to develop. And 
Um, with that, though, I'll turn things over to Huda to introduce our second series of provocations. Great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm going to go sign into the Discord right now and check it out. Thanks for listening, everyone. I'm not sure we're on yet. Would like to have confirmation. You're in the center of my screen. You you, you appear to have focus. So okay, great. So let's let's do it. Um, thank you, Catherine. Thank you also to the capstone speaker uh, for a fantastic talk. I'm Huda from KU Leuven in Belgium and I'll be chairing the second provocation session. So in this session, we will be hearing three short talks. We will first start with Making Sense of the Sea of Dashboard by Michael Correll and Heather Frölich. Um, following that, we will learn about using visual analytics for preservation and documentation of marginalized perspectives. And that will be by Audrey Reinert and David Ebert. And finally, we will end uh, with uh, the provocation Data is Never Raw. And that is authored by Micah Vandergrift, uh, Ashley Evans, Andy, and Scott Bailey. So same as before, we will first hear the author's provocations back to back. They will be live and we will follow that with a Q&A session. So everyone feel free to send in your questions and um, also throughout the provocations uh, on Discord and on YouTube so that we can discuss them. So let's jump right in. I will give the floor now to Heather and Michael. Go ahead. Can we see our screen? We are yes. in presenter view. Okay, one second then. Okay, uh, hopefully you can see all this. Sorry about the delay. Okay, we are live. Michael, why don't you go ahead and get started? Great, thanks. Yes, so this is a, a collaborative provocation written between me and Heather. Um, and what we're looking at is addressing, I'd call maybe some of the folklore around uh, how we conceive of dashboards in data visualization, but elsewhere, right? So there's this very, straightforward kind of Kipling just so story, which is that, you know, you had the model, you had the model T, which had only two buttons. And then as the world got more complex, uh, you started moving more and more things into it. Um, and then, you know, you end up with a dashboard, in this case is the dashboard of the space shuttle that has all of these, these components and other bits to it. Um, and then an information dashboard sort of is supposed to connect the story in the same way. Um, so for instance, um, you move from this metaphor of you are seeing the world around you and bringing in information and controlling it to now the sort of idea of a dashboard as a, as a mission control center, right? Things go in. So on the left, we have the Chilean uh, CyberSend project, which you know is supposed to run the entire economy of the country from this kind of Star Trek looking room. 
Uh, and then on the right, you know, you have the war room from Dr. Strangelove, right? So these are both a totalizing space where information goes in and decisions go out. I mean, it's dashboards as, as architecture. Um, and that goes also for the stories that people tell uh, of how they market things like visual analytics and dashboards and data science in general uh, to the world, right? So here are two mid 20th century ads, both advertising punch card machines, right? So on the left, IBM promises you can be everywhere and watch everything uh, where their German subsidiary on the right just promises oversight you know, beneath the all seeing eye. So to me, this seems to be the original project of dashboards. There are these panopticons where data comes in from an, you know, an objective world and you monitor it as a decision maker and you adjust things and the world around you changes as a response to your decision making. Um, so that's the folklore. And then Heather is going to jump in and explain where I think we are now. Yes, and so we can see that all these different dashboards try to show us somewhat different kinds of data, even though they're presumably showing us the same kind of data over and over again. We see, you know, different color coding, we see little circles, we see a line that goes up, we see a line that goes down, we see all sorts of different things. And we, we collectively, Michael and I have been talking a lot about this in terms of a sort of moving from this idea of watching all of it at once to watching it all in a sort of mindless movement between these different dashboards, hoping that we get the right kind of information in the way that feels good to us. So we might look at the John Hopkins dashboard, we might look at the Washington State dashboard, we're gonna be looking at the other dashboard that's up here. Um, and we're just sort of, we're taking Marion's idea of the inflammation planner and wandering around looking for different kinds of material in hopes of getting what we want to see, which ends up kind of becoming this sort of spectacle. You know, we're not actually engaged in the, these questions. We're just sort of watching these things idly and taking them in. And so another way of thinking about this is even kind of imagining it as rooting for the home team. We don't really know what we want to see happen other than we want to see these numbers go down. We want to see things look a lot more like China down there with the yellow line, but we don't really have a chance to do much with this information other than just generally absorb it. And in that sense, we're really losing power, we're losing control, and we're losing the ability to make any kind of informed strong decision in the same way that a spectacle really sort of removes. So um, I just want to kind of close by offering a couple of really big important questions are BIQs, which is who are we making these dashboards for and why? Our dashboards just a form of consultation theater, a way of kind of making us feel like we're engaged in the consultation process, but not actually talking to anyone. And finally, how is technology involved in informing, placating, controlling, and, uh, and the publics? And so these are just some ideas that we're floating around here. We have a much longer form version of this. If you go to bit.ly spectacle dash, you can read our many long form thoughts about this, but thank you all very much for your time. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Audrey Reinert, and I'm a postdoc at the Data Institute for Societal Challenges at the University of Oklahoma. So the idea for this provocation came from a relatively simple question. Can members of a dominant cultural group faithfully represent the experiences of marginalized groups? A good example with this is, how do you represent the experiences of two-spirit individuals? Now, for those who don't know, two-spirit is a modern uh, pan-Indian umbrella term used by some indigenous North Americans um, to describe native people in their communities who fulfill a traditional third gender or other gender variant ceremonial role. Okay, now, why would we wanna study this? Well, there's some interesting intersections of gender presentation, indigenous history, US history, religious practice, cultural anthropology, I could go on, but we don't have time. But here's the problem. Two-spirit is functionally pretty meaningless in a lot of these communities. Those communities, those indigenous nations that did have a, a term that felt would fall under the two-spirit label would really prefer that you use the cultural specific term. The other problem is two-spirit, well, it obscures some pretty specific linguistic differences and cultural nuances. It takes the vast panoply of indigenous experience in the United States and reduces it down to a meaningless buzzword. And also this term is kind of seen as being overly positive and it fundamentally misrepresents the lived experiences of these individuals. It's an externally applied label 
And it's also heavily influenced by modern scholarship. This really only came around in 1990. The term is as old as I am. So it's very, very new. And it's also influenced by the modern LGBT scholarship work. So why is this an issue? Well, the digital humanities and computer science as a discipline have a, di a diversity problem. We're mostly white, we're mostly male, and we're mostly from the global north. What this means is that we are directly and indirectly influenced in how we represent data products from, and perspectives of these historically marginalized groups. Further, we need to consider that the methods, tools, projects, and other platforms we use are just gonna inherently decenter narratives and data products produced by digital communities and groups in the global south. Further, we also are inherently framing a lot of really complicated conversations that we need to be having regarding say gender, ethnicity, gender presentation, religion from a purely US and Eurocentric lens. So why does this matter? Well, it biases what we consider minor to be minority status, further contributing to this exclusion of data products produced by these marginalized groups and marginalized communities. And the other reason, well, it damages our ability to grow and to recruit new the new more diverse generation of scholars that are coming up. Uh, you know, it's really hard being the only person of color in a room full of white men. Your perspective is just not gonna be seen as valuable. And finally, it also reinforces the belief that marginalized perspectives are just too niche, too complicated, too hard, or even just too, straight up too political to merit significant investment. Now I do have more, I unfortunately overprepared, but just for the sake of time, I'm gonna turn it over to the next presenter. Hey everyone, hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, my name is Ashley evans Bandy, and our provocation Data is Never Raw is an effort between Micah Vandegrift, Scott Bailey, and myself. And we believe that a misunderstood issue in the use of the term data in DH and Viz collaborations is the double occlusion of the data's constructed nature and their tactical deployment by and against humanist scholars. So to quote to Hannah Drucker, not for the first time today, to begin, the concept of data as a given has to be rethought through a humanistic lens and characterized as capta, taken and constructed. So at a base level, data are never raw, they are never observer-independent states of affairs. When data are collected, they are collected through created instruments that embed decisions and interpretations. So in a file, table, or database, data have already been processed and fit into human schemas. So these data might be meaningful representations to their consumers, but they aren't raw presentations of reality. So in visualization, we're dealing with re-representation of a mediated thing. So visualization is capped at two levels, constructed in creation and storage, and again in graphical media, which instantiate human interpretive frames. So the question becomes, how do we attend to the ways that interpretive frames embed in data that can be read by others as raw or unprocessed? Also, the deployment of the term data in and around the humanities is itself loaded with expectations. The use of the term data is tactical, recalling Kirschenbaum, used precisely for its alignment with STEM and the ongoing efforts of humanistic researchers for relevance, survival, and funding under what we could call University Inc. So DH and Phys projects as data scholarship is not raw, unbiased, but a means to an end. So the utility of data terminology for DH is crucial. We participate in and affirm the data turn as it opens doors, particularly in connection to visual methods and tools, yet clarity about the purpose of our language is necessary to situate the critical approach that we must have while positioning our work in a stream of university, industry, and cultural memory resources. So if data gets a foot in the door, like let's be clear about why we're in the room and what we intend to do there. So we believe the current moment is an opportunity for humanists to do just that. And by current moment, we refer to questions of data neutrality in terms of code, algorithms, AI, and visualization being picked up, especially this past year in popular media. Scholars that immediately come to mind for us are Noble, Posner, Broussard, Klein, and Dignazio, who we just heard. Um, adopting transparency practices is one place where DH projects have an opportunity to push back on the illusion of objectivity. Humanists are not new to the human construction of data. And this is a strength humanists can bring to the table, which could take the form of required documentation, such as readme files, metadata, or narratives that contextualize data and visualizations, and their deployments in academic and public studies. 
So this moment invites us to employ a new strategy in visualization and DH collaborations where the term data is still tactical, but now acknowledged to need analysis of the subjective. So now is the time for humanists to help build a community where documenting the lack of objectivity in data and data isn't a best practice, but a requirement of scholarship. And I will turn it over to Ashley. Okay, great. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you for, to all the um, all the speakers actually for these uh, interesting well questions. Um, as we're waiting for the questions from the on the Discord, I will start with one of my own. So I find that there was a, a an interesting um, maybe not disagreement, but well a divergence of thought on the intentionality or the well, whether it's tactical or not to first portray data as an objective thing or um, to allow systems like dashboards, for example, to become these kind of spectacles. Um, so my question is, well, I would really would like to hear from the different authors about this dichotomy between intentional, uh, tactical or something incidental, or maybe that's due to higher systems as well as the maybe the well the different benefits the different industrial economical or social benefits to allowing these to happen i i guess i can go first uh um although i think audrey i think you're muted if you were talking but Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so um, some of it, I think it is, I think there is a, a conscious effort, right? Like these are, in many cases, if these visualizations act to reinforce existing hegemonies, um, right? That's sometimes a conscious project that people undertake. Um, but it's just as often an unconscious project, right? Like, you know, our, our biases come along with us, they're built with us, like our, our lived experiences reinforce particular ones. Um, so to some extent, it, the question, right, the outcome is going to be the same, whether it's conscious or not. Um, the conscious one is just kind of um, maybe easier to diagnose, um, but it also kind of lets people off the hook, right? There's, um, there's this thing that I call like the fatal premise, um, which is, um, only bad people do bad things. I'm personally not a bad person, therefore I don't do bad things, right? So that second one is the fatal premise. Uh, and a lot of times when people are working with data, when I talk to them, uh, when you frame the question about intentionality, what you get is, well, you know, I'm not the, the Fox News person who's messing around with the chart to make the data say this thing, like, you know, I'm not being dishonest, I'm just presenting the data. Um, so therefore, you know, my, I'm, I'm not a bad person, so I know that my responsibility is good and my impact and intentions are good. Um, when, of course, you know, that that's not how that works. That's not how that self-reflection works. Um, so I do, I do, intentionality is sometimes there, it's sometimes not there, um, but there's problems even when it isn't, I guess is how I would summarize all that. Yeah, and I would follow up on what Michael just said and, and just kind of add that even when the best intentions are there, an audience may not necessarily have the ability to infer the things you want them to infer. And this is something that Michael and I talked a lot about when we were writing our paper. You know, what happens when someone misinterprets some data points or misinterprets a chart and understands one thing when it's really trying to show you something else? Like what, what, what's the outcome of that? And that's not intentional necessarily, I hope, but it may turn out to be something that has much more far reaching impl impl uh, you know, implications challenges, things like that. So it's very much on the forefront of my mind for sure. And I think it's a really interesting question. So for the kind of data that I was talking about, especially when we're de dealing with data related to marginalized communities, and I'm just gonna stick with indigenous uh, North Americans, we need to consider the history of the of how these data products and how these narratives have been presented to us and us being mostly white mostly first uh mostly folks from the global north uh, we need to remember that much of the first-hand experience at least as it would have been pre-colonization we may never have a good record of that because keep in mind christian missionaries would have come in and 
you know, they really didn't have a lot of interest in accurately preserving this sort of information. And we also need to remember that because of that destruction of cultural knowledge, which that's bad, um, we, we may never be able, and I'm saying we, both as people interacting with, the, with indigenous communities and indigenous communities themselves, may never be able to fully recreate that knowledge. So when we're trying to represent something as complex and nuanced as this, there is a very real temptation to kind of fall back on this relatively safe, positive sounding term, but in doing so, it, it obscures some very specific differences. And I'd be happy to talk about this, um, you know, in a one on one Zoom call if people are interested in that, because I don't want to take up everyone's time. To me, one of the interesting questions around this is um, how we either encourage or enforce the types of requirements of uh, context accompanying a visualization. So we're thinking in the academic context, we could have a journal that puts a mandatory, you have to have some methodology statement that explains the issues of the data collection, the types of biases that might be there and the intentionality of using data in that particular way. But if we look at things like COVID dashboards, what's the governing body that determines who can or cannot put up a dashboard, or if we're looking at groups that are in sort of less regulated groups, like how is it that we either create the expectations um, for this accompanying context that explains bias, or how is it that we create social systems that do it, or otherwise, how do we try try to manage um, manage that aspect of it? Great, thank you all for your responses. So we have another question that's coming in from Discord from Marianne Dirk, um, who asks um, Ashley and Scott particularly, if you could elaborate on the double occlusion that you mentioned of data and this, if you could explain, if you um, could elaborate how it can be explained and conveyed. So, our initial thought of this was, in some ways, our, our provocation shouldn't be that provocative. The, the idea that data is biased in itself, we would hope that people sort of understand. But it, you know, given the number of sort of raw data entries you have in Harvard Dataverse, that's not the case. Uh, so that's that's the first conclusion. What is what is the way in which the data itself is is already embodying the cultural frames and going back to things like gender and binary gender encoded in the data scheme itself. And then the second aspect we thought of as in some ways, the linguistic use of the term data within the humanities. Um, so we have both the data itself, but then the deployment of that data and the language of data about it, which tries to call out some amount of objectivity uh, or some amount of sci scientific character in fields that maybe have been seen as less scientific as a sort of claim of authority. Um, and whether we look at this, I'm, you know, Ash and I are both in libraries. So we think about this from a bit of the library perspective. And there's a library report recently that talked about digital scholarship and actually it was all just data science. Uh, this is the ARL CNI Educause report. Uh, the whole thing on digital scholarship was all data science. So what's the, what are the issues or what type of occlusion of power is occurring when we start to reduce the language that we use or how we deploy language tactically, either to get funding, money, secure, uh, secure our place in the university or the academic world or in industry or, or whatever else. I, I, I like that perspective, uh, especially it sort of reminds me, um, I think I was complaining on Twitter, right, that all of these viz papers and, and um, you know, often viz theses will have a paragraph at the beginning is like the rate of data is increasing exponentially. And I'm like, who is this paragraph for, right? Like, who's it serving? Um, I don't know, you know. Aren't there small data problems that are just as interesting? Um, but yeah, no, it, it's 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 advocating for resources is like the way that I, I kind of built it up in my head, right? Like this, you know, claw, clawing away any of the tools we need to do our work requires negotiating with this entity. And so you need to show that not that just it's an interesting problem or a useful problem, but it's this big, all encompassing, exponentially increasing problem, um, which is how data especially seems to be framed a lot in you know from from the viz side of things um which I, I think comes with its own challenges um it's also 
a, a point in something you said rem reminded me that um, there's, I think by this point, people, I at least hopefully realize that data, you know, is not raw, objective, you know, harrowing view from nowhere stuff at this point. Um, but now the rhetorical trick to sort of avoid coming to terms at that point seems to be to shove the responsibility for all of that position taking somewhere else. Um, so this is also something I feel that Biz is guilty of where, um, oh, well, we didn't collect the data, we're just visualizing the data, right? So it's not our problem. Um, you know, we, all the rhetorical commitments were made before we got it. Um, so that's that's a position that I really worry about, right? Is, is, is that um, somehow there's kind of a laundering step where we, yeah, we know the data is biased and comes from whatever, but you know, that's, that's what we have. Um, and that happens at the curation stage, it happens at the collection stage, it happens at the, at the circulation stage too. Perfect, thank you. <clears throat> so to follow up on that, <laughs> sorry, we have a question from uh, Eric Alexander also coming in from Discord, who is asking Heather and Michael particularly, um, if you now actively avoid, <clears throat> sorry, if you now actively avoid doing dashboard scrolling, or if there is a bit of do as I say and not as I do going on. Guilty as charged. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, same. I'm, I'm definitely guilty of it. I'm still, you know, kind of bouncing around. In the longer form version of this, we talk a lot about how different universities came up with different uh, dashboards to kind of show spread on campus and how that may or may not intersect with the state or county area level dashboards and some of the challenges inherent in that. And I still find myself every once in a while hopping onto our university dashboard and going, hmm, how are we doing? How does that compare to what it says for the county? How does it say what it compares to the state? Things like that. And uh, even though I'm conscious of it, I catch myself still doing it for sure. All right. Um, we have another question also for uh, the for Heather and um, Michael, uh, which has to do with um, the timing of this well of the discussion. So he asks, how much do you think that this timely dashboard swan song has been influenced by the obvious absence of anyone interested in data or dashboard at all in the U.S. administration? Um, level and if there had or if there would have been the need for a similar provocation under a different administration. I mean, you know, power, power is going to do what power is going to do, I think, right? Like, you know, a lot of the things that we were talking about, especially these college dashboards, right? There's the administrative incentives for you know, this consultation theater are going to exist no matter who's in the power structure. Um, so some of some of these issues still that, you know, they're connected with the things like the rise of social media and the splitting of discourses and, you know, the mainstreaming of conspiratorial thought that certainly happens in conjunction with these larger political movements in the US and elsewhere, but um, not independent of it and not orthogonal to them. Um, yeah. And I think there's also a second part of this in which when Michael and I were discussing this early on, we talked a little bit about, you know, the Hunger Games and Shirley Jackson's The Lottery. And we're kind of like, these are not truly one to one experiences. I mean, they're close. Come see what the latest, latest and greatest news update is. But it's not really the latest and greatest in the same sense. So, I mean, kind of yes and kind of no. And I, and I agree with Michael when he says that it's really going to fall into a category of power is going to do what power is going to do. Right? Like, at a, a local government level, it could look very different than a national government level. So, I mean, I think it's more complicated than that, for sure. But I definitely agree that it's it's very much driven by people with power who want to do these things. And that goes back to what Catherine and uh, Lauren were saying earlier. Great, that's a fantastic answer. Thank you so much. Uh, so with that, I think the time is, um, yeah, it's getting a bit short. So uh, we also don't have any more questions on Discord. Um, so thank you again for the panelists, for the provocations that you've presented and for all these fantastic answers. We have some conversation going on in Discord that you are welcome to join and you are also welcome and everyone from Discord and YouTube and the whole internet is also welcome to join us on uh, Gather Town to continue this conversation. Thank you again and we have a break now um, and we'll continue on with the fourth session after the break. Thank you again, everyone.
DVR has always been from considerable interest to the scientific community. To this day, traditional desktop setups are the gold standard. However, what if we could utilize DVR in virtual reality? Now you think, VR and DVR are so computationally expensive, how is this even feasible? Come to my talk and we present you a straightforward solution to visualize volumetric datasets with high refresh rates on VR devices. White space surfaces are a novel approach to convey depth in vessel visualizations. The core idea is to shift all additional depth cues away from geometry and to use the usually empty space between the vascular structures. This allows us to display functional parameters on the surface and supporting cues on the background. We will explain how to generate such surfaces and how to use them as a canvas to further enhance depth and shape perception. Hello. Student competition is intrinsic to the pedagogy of cybersecurity education. At RIT, we have observed that the collegiate penetration testing competition and other related competitions are missing a key element, visualization. In this position paper, we provide an architecture and plan to create compelling experiences for participants and spectators. In doing so, we can potentially attract new talent into the field. Serum graphs are variants of stack graphs with curved baseline, and the main factor affecting its readability is the sign lurens through a perceptual inconsistency of the orthogonal and vertical direction. Aiming at reducing its impacts, we revisited the baseline formulation and proposed the concept of composition to help the serum graph layout optimization. The results show that our algorithms perform better than the others. A dynamic graph models changing relationships between entities over time. In this work, we present multi-scale snapshots, a vision analytics approach to provide an overview of a dynamic graph at multiple temporal scales. The approach consists of three steps, creating multi-scale temporal summaries, applying graph embeddings, and the semi-automatic visual analysis. The combination of these steps lets us visually explore how temporal and structural properties affect the overall dynamic graph. Ray tracing techniques can create images of astonishing realism and beauty. In the last years, the performance of those techniques has been increased significantly using dedicated hardware. Who thought that it's also possible to accelerate this? We show how to dramatically accelerate force-directed graph drawing with RT cores, yielding a speed up of 4 to 13x. If you want to know more, please see our talk. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter, so you can make better decisions faster. Connect to the data you care about. Sort, highlight, drill down, or filter your data in seconds. Add calculations to extend your data. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. In this study, we designed a system named Constructed Explorer to facilitate the causal analysis. Users can explore the causal graph to perceive the causality and it is uncertainty, validate the causality with the raw data, and apply the confirmed causality to what-if analysis. CMED is a visual analytics framework for exploring medical image data annotations acquired from crowdsourcing. CMED can be used to visualize, classify, and filter crowdsourced clinical data based on a number of different metrics such as detection rate, logged events, and clustering of the annotations.
CMED provides several interactive linked visualization components to analyze the crowd annotation results for a particular video and the associated workers. Visualizing streaming of big data may be difficult if the visual idiom gets cluttered. Although some techniques solve this issue by aggregating data into different idioms, each representing a different period, they still lack transitions to help people understand how data points get from one visual idiom to another. To solve this issue, we proposed several transitions between several pairs of visualizations. We tested them through a user study where participants watched a video per transition and had to answer seven questions. We present NL4DV, a toolkit that helps prototype natural language interfaces for data visualizations. NL4DV provides a high-level Python API for interpreting natural language queries. The API automates the core tasks of processing natural language queries to infer relevant information and determine appropriate visualizations, allowing visualization developers to focus more on designing and implementing the user interface. The daily work of criminalists consists of analyzing relationships in complex data while proposing and verifying multiple hypotheses, often under heavy pressure. This poses high demands on their memory and cognitive capacity. We present Visaland, a tool that helps investigators track their visual exploration and reasoning. It organizes analytical states in a graph structure, which can be revisited and shared with colleagues. We present TransPIS, a design study that is proposed to analyze and integrate close and distant reading of multiple translations. TransPIS presents the overview of the collection to capture global patterns that is facilitated by the ADM VIP matrix. TransPIS integrates a detailed view to explore interesting path of alignments. We also propose the TLC view to examine and explore the terms of the user selected path to justify and reason the AD analysis. Hurricanes, air pollution, forest fires, urban sprawl, ocean plastics, politics, traffic jams, and pandemics. So many of our modern challenges are geospatial, and so much of our big data is geospatial. How is the Viz community addressing needs to visualize and analyze this data? Our review examines IEEE Viz's recent contributions to geovisualization and geospatial analysis. We propose an interactive ensemble analysis framework that provides flexible interactive exploration of the ensemble data. Time series characteristics of data can be obtained by fast browsing time steps. The region stability heat map view shows the stability of the selected region and provides region adjustment by directly clicking. In this paper, we investigate design choices for work or flat maps by domain experts. We tackle two research questions, how do domain tasks influence the design choices, and what equal error projection is preferred. Through a survey, we collected 40 corpolith maps designed by 20 social scientists, and our analysis suggests that the choices vary across tasks, the projection was most important, and the equal error projection was preferred. In a visualization, laying out labels to data points needs to be done automatically with a fast labeling algorithm. We introduce occupancy bitmap. It's a data structure that helps the labeling algorithm to first, quickly record the positions of existing marks and labels, and second, quickly detect overlapping of labels to the recorded positions.
imagine you have tons of text data to analyze. And you want to get an overview of your data, but traditional topping modeling techniques such as LDA are not working for you. Then, why don't you try Architext? We introduced a scalable and flexible way to interactively build hierarchical topics. We demonstrate that people can use the spatial cues available in virtual reality to help them effectively remember and recall scholarly articles. We used a virtual coffee shop and asked participants to remember four abstracts from scientific publications. And we termed this method a virtual reality memory palace variety. The success of a cultural neural network has been attracting many students and practitioners to learn the exciting technology. However, for beginners, the CN model is not easy to understand. We introduced the explainer, an interactive realization tool to help beginners more easily learn about convolutional neural network. Using the explainer, users can progressively explore the CN model with real life images in their browser, gaining a comprehensive understanding of both high level model structure and the low level underlying mathematical operations. Magazine-style narrative visualizations can be challenging due to the need to go back and forth from the text to the visualization. We use eye tracking to monitor which sentence is currently being read and trigger visual links between that sentence and the corresponding data points in the visualization. Results show that the gaze-driven links increase comprehension of the documents without hindering reading time. In this presentation, we introduce a provenance library, TRAC, which makes implementing provenance in web-based tools easy. TRAC introduces a novel storage model for web-based provenance tracking and has an associated history visualization, which can be fully customized. TRAC also contains multiple ways to save and share individual states or entire sessions of an application and ensures that explored data is easy to analyze in interesting and unique ways. We propose X-Matrix, a novel method for random forest interpretability. From a random forest model, a logic rule is extracted from each decision path on every decision tree. Once the complete set of logic rules is obtained, visual representations can be built for global and local explanations. X-Matrix, making random forests interpretable. Program developers spend significant time on optimizing and tuning applications. But working with binary code to understand what compiler optimizations were applied can be challenging. We present our visual analytics system, CCNAP, designed to identify and assess compiler optimizations in binary code. Check out our paper to learn more. How many times have you asked yourself, why should I stay in academia? Junior researchers might ask this more often, but it's a popular topic among all levels of academic seniority. Our six panelists will discuss with you the controversial topic of pursuing an academic path in visualization, targeting an open discussion on the choice of staying or leaving, and keeping the specifics of our community in mind. Digital humanities present great opportunities for testing new visualization approaches and evaluation techniques. However, and given the diffuse character and novelty of the field, it may also be intimidating for novel and senior researchers willing to get started in the discipline. In this paper, we propose a data-driven analysis of visualization for the digital humanities to identify key themes, authors, and relevant publications. So if you want to know more, please read our paper. If machine learning were like education, we would like to test what concepts our student, the model, has learned. Has it learned the concept of object rotation? Does additional text help with object recognition? We need a methodology and platform for conducting such tests. In this paper, we present a novel visual analytics tool that enables hypothesis-based evaluation of machine learned models.
Transport dynamics in an unsteady flow can be visualized by the finite time lap on a fixed point. But what happens 